they challenge you to think about, okay, what is really the most important to me mm -hmm. um, in my life? Um, and from there, once you've chosen those core values, a next step could be to say, okay, what kind of goals am I going to set for my personal and professional life that will get me more in alignment with those values? What a great tool to use both at the beginning of your career, all through your career to, you know, ensure that you're really doing something that feels purposeful to you. Welcome to the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast, where green practices meet profitable solutions. Join us as we uncover the latest trends in eco-friendly hospitality that not only safeguard our planet, but also drive down operating costs and boost revenue. Every week, we will bring you compelling conversations with industry leaders who are at the forefront of merging sustainability with economic success. Whether you're a hotelier, a resort manager, or a passionate traveler, this is your gateway to the future of sustainable hospitality. Tune in and let's explore how going green is good for both the earth and your bottom line. We're your hosts, Amy Wald and Kathy McGuire. Welcome back everyone to the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Green Lux. Make sure you go to our website, that's www.greenluxeinc and sign up for our new newsletter. We're going to bring you bite-sized information to stay up to date on all of the sustainable hospitality news that you need to know to start your sustainability journey. Today, though, we are so thrilled to welcome Rachel Vandenberg. She's a hotelier. She is a leadership coach, a speaker, and a podcast host. And she's going to tell us all about her journey in and out of hotel ownership and operations and now how you can really propel yourself in the leadership space, really regardless of the industry you're in. Hi, Rachel. How are you today? I'm well. How are you, Amy? Thanks for having me. I'm great. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm excited about this conversation. I am excited about the intersection of leadership and hotel management, ownership, life, and you know, really how you kind of identify your values to help you drive whatever mission you're on in life, which we're gonna talk about. Um, we actually met at the Forward Conference That's this right. past, I think that was April, May. And, and the end of April, yep. You gave an a, incredibly valuable um, presentation and hopefully we can talk a little bit about that, but enough of, me talking, would you uh, introduce yourself to the audience and give, just give us a little background um, how you got to where you are today? Sure. Yeah. So I actually grew up in the hotel business. Uh, I lived above our uh, farmhouse in, it, it was a converted farmhouse in when I was a kid. And as a teenager and college student, I worked in our family's restaurant. I also held other positions at the front desk over the years and then really took a kind of 180 pivot away from hospitality and pursued politics and sociology in college was much more interested in international relations and human rights and development work and then ended up going to the Netherlands where my family's from and pursuing a career there and living there for nine years before getting the call, I guess you could say, um, to come back and take over the family hotel. Wow. Uh, so that is not the typical path of hotel ownership, but it makes no. sense that because it was in your blood, um, but you you really kind of resisted that in the beginning. I think I've read in a few places and we talked about. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, well, we I also shared it, I think, in the in at the beginning of my introduction in my uh, workshop that I gave at forward as well, that it really it didn't seem like the industry that I wanted to go into. 
uh, after having experienced it as a child. But um, I really turned around from that. And when I remembered what kind of lifestyle and opportunities that our family to hotel had offered me as a child and had at that point two children of my own, I started to think differently about it. I also started to think about the opportunities to work in a business where you can have in your, your hands in so many different topics um, from operations to sales and marketing um, to running a brick and mortar business um, to building your community. It really, it offers really an a, a awesome challenge and opportunity to stretch your skill set and uh, I came to love it. And that's why I, I ended up running our hotel for 12 years up until last year, and then really started focusing more on my biggest passion, which is leadership development. And that led me to become a certified coach. And because I still love hospitality very much, I'm very much focused on professionals and leaders in the hospitality and travel and tourism industry. And we're going to, of course, talk about the travel leader coach business that you have in the podcast. But I really want to know, let's start out by talking about some of the stories that you remember as a little person in the hotel. Are there, I'm always so fascinated about, you know, I think a lot of us get that travel bug if we didn't grow up in the hotel business as a little person. So I would love to know what some of those, you know, really unique memories that stuck with you were. Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously having the amenities of a hotel at your fingertips as a child is pretty cool. We had an outdoor pool and eventually my parents had built an indoor pool that they added on with a game room and pool table and ping pong and all of that. So, um, you know, that feels pretty fun when you're a kid. And so I have very fond memories of that. Um, and I think growing up, there was always a job for me and there was always a way to make my own money. Um, and uh, I, I loved also being part of the excitement of a bustling hospitality yeah. business. My, my father started um, with my mother, a breakfast restaurant called the Dutch pancake cafe, and they serve Dutch pancakes, which are similar to crepes, but thicker and, uh, have a lot more ingredients in them. Uh, and it was hugely popular. And uh, so th there was just always this just vibrancy around. And I have very fond memories of that as well uh, growing up. And I'm sure you take so many, you can adopt so many different skills and skill sets working and learning in that environment, you know, from communications to, you know, practical skills, I would think. Do you feel like you took yeah. away some of those as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you just get a really good feel for what it takes to run a business. Uh, and obviously the customer aspect, customer service aspect is huge. So learning to work with, uh, with guests, but and also with other employees and the relationships that you have with team members and staff members, that was also something that definitely stuck with me over the years. So you found yourself working in the hotel, raising a family, doing all the things all at once. When did you really realize that you felt a different calling? And you decided to pivot uh, into not that, you know, running a hotel is being a leader, um, but, you know, focusing more on just that leadership aspect. What, what made you want to do that? Well, I think at a certain point, um, you know, I think everybody comes to a point in their career where they've they've been they've gone through all the levels of challenge in their position and. I used to talk about different frontiers in our business. And a lot of that had to be, had to do with like, had I worked in a particular department before? And 
by the time I finished, I had worked in every department in the hotel besides the only thing I had not done is, is been behind the line in the kitchen cooking. Uh, but my husband has really done every position, uh, because we work together as co-managers and also from just the sense that I just felt like I was starting to reach a ceiling of what I could achieve as an operator. Uh, but also, uh, I just, I just really became clear about what my favorite part of, of being a GM of the hotel was and having a team. And that was a really around leadership. And I was fascinated by what, really looking at what are the skills the, that need to be developed as a leader to, to lead a team and also my own personal development. Like how did I need to change myself and role model good leadership behavior and professional behavior in order to influence the success of the operation. And there were obviously some personal reasons involved as well. My children were all becoming uh, close, either teenagers or close to being teenagers and feeling just like I needed to create some more flexibility uh, to in my, in the, at this point in my life um, to be able to, uh, to kind of manage that part of my life as well. Um, and finally, the, the, we, we ended up hiring a management company for our hotel. And the reason for that as well was there's a lot of economies of scale you can get with bringing in a third party partner like that, who manages our, our partner manages over 30 hotels and there's a lot of efficiencies, you know, we're just one hotel, we're reinventing the wheel a lot. Um, so there, they have tried and tested systems and, and all of that. Um, and, we just felt like we could be more competitive in the market as well if we were to make that change. Interesting. I We hadn't talked about discussing this, but did you vet a lot of management companies or did you just know instantly when you talked to the right one? How did that, what did that look like? No, we definitely, I mean, on paper, you know, I re, we researched several management companies and then we kind of honed it down to a smaller list that we had conversations with and went through the process uh, of, ex, of exploring a partnership and then honed it down to our favorite. So let's talk about, you know, the leadership aspect, how that really integrates into your role in a, in a hotel, how, how do you see, I mean, we, we all know that as a manager, as a general manager, your job is to lead people. Um, but how do you help enhance someone's leadership skills and really set them up for success, not only in their current position, but maybe as they're going through their career, just like you're saying, if they reach a ceiling, now they can kind of dig into their toolbox or they've already displayed these incredible leadership qualities that then qualify them for a higher position or a different position. So, so you mean how, how do I do this as a coach now yes. with, with uh, professionals in the industry? Yes, I mean, sorry if I wasn't clear. Um, don't give away all your secrets, of course, right? Yeah. But, you know, is there a framework or, or how do you start to talk to someone or, you know, why does someone come to you? Do they feel like they need help with it? Where where do they feel stagnated? Um, and, and what does that conversation look like? And then that process. Sure. Yeah. So I think the, the reason why someone would approach a, a an executive coach or a leadership coach like myself is that maybe they're feeling stuck in making progress in their leadership and or they've identified you know some areas where they've run into challenges and they don't know how to break through those challenges so um and you know oftentimes what it takes is that there's a pattern right like something comes back over and over again and and they keep 
running into the same wall. And then it's like, okay, now I really need to do something about this. Um, you know, and a, a lot of it starts, it could be things like interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. It could be um, things like wanting to more like goal based, like wanting to pursue a promotion or a, a different job um, at their companies within their company or outside of their company. Um, and a, a lot of it too could, could stem from a, a sense of confidence, you know, wanting to build their confidence in their position and really not being able to pinpoint the the source of that uh in order to um to achieve that so that's where it kind of begins so when someone comes to me we we take it you know basically one issue at a time and they bring a topic to the session and in the session we're able to unpack okay what's at the root of the challenge the source um that is maybe causing conflict or discomfort um, or stagnation and how do we how do I then can guide them through a process which allows them to move forward in that situation and identify uh, first you know what kind of mindset changes might be necessary and then perhaps what kind of action steps might need to be taken from there to make change so I hope this isn't the wrong thing to say, but it almost sounds a little bit like therapy. Well, there's a lot of, you know, complementarity to therapy, but it's definitely very different. Uh, you know, with coaching, we're really looking Not at, that I've ever been. <laughs> no, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with it. I, I think, uh, you know, everyone uh, at some point in their life could probably use both a coach and a therapist. Absolutely. Um, but you know, we t I t I take situations from from you know what so a, a client brings in a session, and we look at okay, how can we move forward with this situation? Um, and with therapy, you're more looking at looking backwards actually, and looking at in your past like what are could it be some of the causes for the situation you're in there's also a very clear difference when you're when you're dealing with mental health issues coaches are not generally qualified to deal with mental health um themes um some coaches are actually uh certified therapists as well so you could have both but that's a whole different area. And, and we have a code of ethics as coaches to refer in those situations, people to the proper resources for, for handling that. No, absolutely. And I don't want to, you know, um, misguide anyone or, you know, imply that coaching is therapy or vice versa. I just found it interesting because it seems like unpacking um, and getting to the root of problems is similar in the sense, yes. of, you know, yeah. maybe no, you're absolutely right. Somebody, just about other, you know, other issues. But I, I really liked that you pointed out three really specific issues that someone would have. So if they're stuck, um, mm -hmm. they feel stagnation. If there's reoccurring patterns, and then if there's maybe confidence issues. Um, so if you're listening and you're in a leadership role or you're just in any kind of a role and you want to work through those, I think those are good signals to look for. Um, I'm such a believer in seeking advice and seeking help that I think sometimes people, it's hard to recognize until you know what to recognize, if you will. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. So that's, that's really great. So. How do you foresee, you know, these being applied really in a hotel specific situation? Can you give us any situations where um, a hotel manager could identify some of these things in practice? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think that, um, 
you know, one thing that often comes back in leadership and management relationships as part of your job is giving feedback, right? Like giving and receiving feedback. So, um, and that's not an easy thing to do, mm-hmm. right? So it, it's, if you've identified that a team member uh, that you have may perhaps need some, some, um, uh, they need some constructive criticism and you need to have a strategy in, in order to be able to give that. And a lot of times there's a lot of, there's internal beliefs and, and, uh, limitations within ourselves that keep us from effectively doing that. So that's maybe a, that's one sort of topic that might come up in a coaching conversation is, okay, what are those beliefs? What's holding you back from giving that feedback? Um, And how can we kind of break through those? And if you need support in kind of coming up with an action plan, let's walk through the process. And, And through my curiosity as a coach, I would, I'm not providing the answers to the client on how to do that, but I'm asking curious questions so that that the client can themselves come up with the most authentic way for themselves to do that. That's a really great example. Um, And yes, very hard to do really if it's not it's not something that comes natural to you or like you said, you have some underlying issues preventing you from, from doing that or receiving it, either one. So let's talk about values. I know that you, you talk about values a lot, which I absolutely appreciate. I think it's so important for all of us to know what those are and know how to leverage them to make our lives better in work, at home. And I find myself talking a lot about them in a sustainability sense, in an organizational sense, a culture. But how do you apply those to an individual and in a coaching situation? Yeah. I Well, I love this topic. Values is one of my most favorite themes in coaching. Um, you know, and I, I think it's, it, I can start with an example from myself. And so years back when we were doing our hotel expansion, I was really just not myself. And I had gone to a really low point where I wasn't taking care of myself and everything was completely focused on the expansion project that we were doing and all that it took uh, to, to get this project off the ground. And then also having three kids under five years old, uh, really makes it challenging. And I, I lost myself in that process and really, I didn't have clearly defined values. I mean, values, I think they're always there, but you, you don't always put words to them unless Mm -hmm. you've actually done it some reflection very consciously. And at that time, I didn't realize either the power that values have in directing your life, in your your professional life, and your the way you behave, the way you set goals, um, the way you pursue your your success, and and all of that. And when I discovered that the power that values have, and that they help you they help provide a framework in which to make decisions. And that could be at the level of the individual. It could also be at the level of the company, right? As you you were just talking about from a sustainability lens, one of the, the best arguments is coming, coming at it from a value standpoint. Um, so when I identified those values, I started making better decisions that aligned with those values. And the first one was my health and well-being. My well-being, I knew, was something that I valued very, uh, very much. And but my actions were not aligned with that value. So I began to change those actions and behaviors, and um, it became really sacred for me from that point forward. So in a coaching relationship, 
uh, what will often come up is in like, let's go back to that example of giving feedback, right? So we may identify in that conversation that um, someone really values um, like, okay, what, what could they value? They could value like um, happiness and, and they could value like um, a, a joyful working environment. And for some reason for them, they associate giving constructive feedback or criticism as coming in conflict with that value of happiness and joy because someone who's receiving the feedback might not feel so happy and joyful <laughs> about that, right? So in, in that situation, we, we call it out. And, and I would reflect back to the client and say, listen, I understand that joy and happiness are, that it is one of your values. How can we, knowing that, how can we, structure the way in which you give feedback so that you can stay in alignment with your values. Um, and if that's for that first part is about the self-awareness, even knowing in the first place that it was so important to you, um, you know, from the get out, uh, is, is a really important first step. Are there, are there any tools? Are there anything that people, you know, if you're listening to this and it, you, there could be a lot of people that, and I think values are fluid, right? Sometimes they do change based on the, the time in your life. Um, do, do you agree or? Oh yeah. Yeah, okay. definitely. Um, is there, is, is there something out there that some kind of test you can take or, you know, something you can do to solidify what you thought your values were, or maybe it's the first time you're doing this. So there's lots of different val like values exercises okay. out there. And I, I have, I have one that I've um, honed myself, which is my favorite. And I'm happy to give it to any of your guests if okay. you want to email me or if you want to put that into the notes. Absolutely. Um, so happy to, to send that to anybody who's, who's interested. Um, and basically what it does is it takes, um, a list, a long list of value words and asks you to go through a process of like refining. Okay. First choose 10 that feel really, you feel really strongly about, and then whittle them down to about four or five core values. And the questions get more and more difficult or they challenge you to think about, okay, what is really the most important to me, mm -hmm. um, in my life. Um, and from there, once you've chosen those core values, a next step could be to say, okay, what kind of goals am I going to set for my personal and professional life that will get me more in alignment with those values? What a great tool to use both at the beginning of your career, all through your career to, you know, ensure that you're really doing something that feels purposeful to you, or you even can look ahead and say, where do I see myself in so many years based on these values? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, you know, I've forgotten what a valuable tool that is sometimes for work. I feel, I feel very lucky that I'm incredibly passionate about what I do, but that doesn't mean that I'm always operating in line with my values. So it's a good reminder, right. To, to go mm -hmm. back and kind of check in with yourself and. Oh yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, I, I think you could easily on a yearly basis, go through the process, maybe try even a different approach um, to looking at your values um, and looking at them in different ways can actually reveal different things. So. Sure. Sure. So let's switch gears a little bit. You know, we can't have this conversation without talking about sustainability. Um, and I know that you've mentioned that, you know, there were practices, it's something you value a lot. You had a career in sustainability prior to uh, being a hotelier. Um, 
what what did those practices look like? How did you decide what to implement? And um, yeah, what what experience did you have in the hotel business? You know, implementing sustainability practices. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I think after I kind of got settled in running our hotel, I definitely and started to get a better understanding of the day to day operations. I started looking at, OK, well, where are the big issues around waste, um, packaging, um, you know, use of resources? um all those types of things recycling although i've become more of a skeptic of re recycling because i'm really not sure how much is actually getting recycled but that was one of the first things we did is we put a recycle bin in our hotel rooms you know at the time like nobody was doing that mm -hmm. um so that it, at least you know we kind of felt like we were doing something and we we have you know two two bins that gets separately picked up. We have the trash uh, um, uh, container and we have the recycle container uh, that gets picked up by our, our vendor. Um, but then it, then the, I started looking at other areas. So for example, I hated the waste from uh, single use amenities. So very early on, we went to bulk uh products and bulk dispensers and also way before they were really mainstream or being starting to be talked about in terms of regulation um another area when we opened our restaurant i knew that from the get-go i wanted to make sure that we were composting even though the law was not you know the law was not coming into place for a few years and um but I wanted to be sure that we were taking that step from day one. So those are some of the small ways. We also looked at our, our breakfast when we were doing a continental, when we started, the, when we took over the hotel and we were doing the continental breakfast, everything was, um, you know, single serve yogurts and everything was packaged. So we transitioned to um, a bulk and using like dispensers to bulk serve all everything. Uh, and one of the biggest things we did was implement geothermal uh, when we did our um, hotel expansion. So, you know, there's there's been some things along the way that have happened, but, you know, unfortunately with COVID, there were also some setbacks uh, you know, just look at the breakfast situation, right? Like you could not serve in bulk containers. Everything yep. had to go back to being prepackaged, and there were so many hurdles around that. So that's disappointing to see the the uh, the losses that came from that. Um, it also the breakfast issue uh, demonstrates also one of the biggest challenges in implementing sustainable practices is that the cost benefit analysis of labor versus uh, when you have a buffet style that has to be, you know, you need the human resources to keep up with it and to not use, uh, um, you know, plastic forks and knives and plates, you have, to, that means you have to have someone there to wash the dishes. Yes. So that's, that has been really, challenging, you know, from a, a labor perspective, especially after COVID, labor has skyrocketed uh, and has forced us to make some changes um, that I would have rather have not made. But yeah. yeah, and I think you touch on some good points. There's, you know, there's there's lots of barriers, although we see a lot of momentum happening right now. There's still those barriers, cost barriers, in, you know, labor barrier, time, you name it. What are some other things that you think prevent a hotel from adopting practices? Well, I think what complicates things is when uh, sometimes, you know, regulations 
that are in place that are supposed to be environmentally friendly are are really completely impractical or irrelevant or don't make sense you know and and cost a lot of money to implement we've had some challenges with that where just the process of of that's been put into place through regulation has just gotten completely out of control. I mean, for instance, when we were building our expansion project, uh, as part of the energy efficiency requirements of one of our biggest regulations, permit processes to, to build the new building, we had to identify fixtures, lighting and plumbing fixtures at a stage in the project where we were completely not ready to provide those kinds of details. And so you go through and you're, I mean, you're literally identifying which kind of light fixtures before you've even designed the room. And then months later, you had to, we had to go back and do it all again because we weren't, we weren't, it was like a chicken or egg situation. Sure. So there's, there's just things like that where there's a mismatch in understanding about the, the, process. The, the process or just the lack of care, you know, they don't care. Um, and well, we're just going to put this in there and you need to comply with it. Um, which is really frustrating and creates a big challenge, even for someone for like me who who does have that value of wanting to be energy efficient and you know doing the right things in terms of a sustainability perspective. That's really good insight, and I think in when I think about that, I think that's why our state associations are so important to make sure they're working with the governments and officials and, you know, in a perfect world, be working in tandem with them to create those regulations and those policies. Um, but that's not necessarily happening either. But I think in a perfect world, yeah. that would happen. So yeah. let's talk about Sun and Ski Resorts. Uh, in, I apologize. It's no, that's Sun okay. Sun, Sun and Ski Inn and Suites. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sun and Ski Inn and Suites in Vermont. And you're in Stowe, correct? Yes. Somewhere I've never been. It's on my list. I've heard it so beautiful. Um, tell us all about it. And how can people that are listening book their next vacation? Do you operate in the summer also? Is it, is it sure. seasonal? How does that, how does that work? Yep. So yeah, we're open all year round. Uh, we live in a mountain, uh, we are, live and operate in a mountain resort town. So in the winter there's skiing, we have downhill skiing, cross country skiing and other snow sports. And in the summer or um, dry, other dry seasons, both in spring and fall, we have hiking and walking and running. Um, we also have a nearby reservoir where people can do some water sports um mountain biking is really big here in the summer as well so it's a very outdoors community very picturesque and beautiful um and you know lots of different events uh sprinkled throughout the year and we have great restaurants a very beautiful and cute historic downtown village um which just adds to the whole atmosphere and vibe of the area and just a really great community which I think even as a visitor, you, you get really a sense of um, in terms of that local spirit. So you're a full service hotel, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So I forgot the part about the hotel. So, yeah. So we have, we are full service hotel. We have 39 rooms. Oh, that's a good um, size. Yep. Uh, 39 rooms. We have an eight lane bowling alley with a, boutique. It's a boutique bowling alley with a restaurant and bar. We also have an 18 hole miniature golf course. Oh my um, gosh. And so, yeah, very family friendly and family oriented, uh, or the adventure couple, as we like to say. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. 
And so how far out do people need to book? Is this, you know, do you guys, you know, book up, for instance, for the ski season way in advance or? I would say uh, for the weekends, particularly in our high seasons, uh, our busiest months of year, August, September, and February. So we touch upon three major uh, seasons. So I definitely recommend, recommend if you're looking at those peak weekends, you need to be several months in advance um, to be sure to get availability. Um, there may be some holes here and there that get filled or that are open. Uh, but just be safe. It's it's good for those peak times. But otherwise, you know, midweek or shoulder seasons um, can be much more last minute. Awesome. Makes me want to go right away. I love skiing. I'm not, great at it. I'm not great at it, but I enjoy skiing and the whole, yeah. you know, the whole culture. So, Rachel, how can people get a hold of you? You have a podcast. Tell us all about that. Yeah. And um, yeah, how can they reach out if they would like some more information on coaching and and all, all of the things that you offer? All the things. All yeah. the things. So our hotel website is www.sunandskiin.com. And my coaching and content company is www.thetravelleadercoach.com. And definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn anytime, Rachel Vandenberg. And listen to my podcast, The Travel Leader, on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all your major outlets. Yeah, and we will list all of those in the show notes. So everybody, we, we make sure they can find you. What can we leave the audience with? Do you have any good zingers or one-liners or really Ooh, powerful? I, I'm, I'm catching you off guard. I didn't tell you to do this. Just thought I'd ask no. you. That's fine. No, I think, well, now that you're asking, I'll, I'll just say, um, you know, I think, I mean, your, your business is all about sustainability. And um, I think where you, you know, you cross over with the work that I do is that sustainability really requires, um, uh, it requires leadership and vision. Uh, and it, 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 re, it kind of reminds me as well as the presentation that you saw in the workshop that I gave um, back at Forward in May, that when you want to bring change about in your organization and sustainability is one of those changes that you might be wanting to implement, you really as a leader need to inspire and motivate your team and give, give them the vision of why we're doing this um, and get that buy-in and create some connection to the purpose around that. Um, so yeah, that's what I'll leave. Everyone I love with. that. I caught you off guard and you deliver. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you. I hope you're not mad at me. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Well, that was a great way to wrap up. We talked about so many things. Thank you for spending time with us. And it was a pleasure. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your summer, um, spending time with your kids in Vermont. And everyone, we are so grateful for you listening and tuning in. But we have to ask if you could please like, subscribe, leave a review so we can continue to bring you these great, insightful conversations with hospitality leaders um, and think people that are doing really great things out there. So uh, please reach out to me on LinkedIn, Amy Wald, and let me know what you liked about this episode, what you'd like to see more of. Um, we're always looking for ideas from you. So we make sure we are bringing you the content that you want to hear about. So we will see you next time on the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. We want to thank you for tuning back into the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. Keep the conversation going and visit the contact page at greenluxinc.com and sign up for our monthly newsletter where we will bring you the latest developments and breaking news in sustainable hospitality and tourism. That's www.greenluxinc.com. And if you're ready to start your sustainability journey and would like some help on knowing what that could look like, 
book a complimentary call with us today. Until our next episode, remember, sustainability is your ticket to a healthier planet and a healthier bottom line. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave us a review.